The Union Commander-in-Chief Abraham Lincoln was beside himself. In the northwestern corner of Georgia, there had been defeat and near disaster back in September of 1863. There, along the banks of Chickamauga Creek, and now in November, the real possibility of yet another reversal. At Chattanooga. Besieged by Braxton Bragg's Confederate Army of Tennessee, Major General U.S. Grant was called in to resurrect sinking morale and restore hope. He corrected the former with the opening of a cracker line. Full bellies and ample ammunition lifted spirits. Now the man from Galena, Illinois, determined to flip the military situation. What his men and officers did was nothing short of amazing. This is the story of the incredible events along the Tennessee River and atop the heights of Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge. This is part two of the story, The Battle of Chattanooga. The last five letters of history spell story, and that's exactly how history should be taught. Numbers and dates have no soul. Such presentations fall flat, for history is alive and relevant. Welcome to Threads from the National Tapestry, stories from the American Civil War. This series will feature events and people from that period and will strive to make you feel as if you were there to show that history is indeed a story. It was a curious twist. Even before the federal cracker line was opened, those in Butternut and Gray the Confederate besiegers atop Lookout Mountain and Missionary Ridge were in as bad a shape as the besieged men in blue below. Indeed, General Braxton Bragg's men were in distress because the Confederate distribution system had broken down, and not only in terms of rations, but ammunition. Truth be known, both sides suffered when it came to ammo. Major General George Thomas's Army of the Cumberland had barely enough ammunition for one day's fighting. Bragg's men had so little that in at least one unit, any soldier who fired his musket without receiving permission was fined 25 cents. And yet, like at Fredericksburg back in December of 1862, Common soldiers used static moments in the siege to do what they did best, fraternize. Once a Confederate sergeant and a Federal soldier became so friendly that the Southerner invited his counterpart to cross the river. And so the Union soldier waded across in waist-deep water, and the two swapped lies, canteens, and tobacco until the Yank waded back. Come to find out, the Federal soldier was none other than Colonel John Wilder of the famed Lightning Brigade, and he was exploring possible river crossings for his men. There was another such story. One day, Grant himself rode down to a stream that provided drinking water to both sides. As he approached, a Federal picket shouted, "'Turn out the guard for the commanding general!' Not wanting to attract attention, Grant said hastily, Never mind the guard. And the men returned to their tents. However, at that very moment, there came a cry from a Confederate sentinel across the creek. Turn out the guard for the commanding general. In short order, a line of men in butternut and gray turned to face Grant and all saluted, to which he returned the respectful gesture. With the Confederate breakdown in supplies, Confederate morale suffered, but there was more. By November the 5th, tension within the Confederate high command resulted in a decision that would have serious consequences. James Longstreet and his men were sent away. Bragg, who didn't get along with him, received permission from Richmond to send Longstreet north, away from Chattanooga. His task now was to give battle to Major General Ambrose Burnside's Union force up at federally held Knoxville. On the last day of October, 1863, Bragg wrote Confederate President Jefferson Davis that Longstreet's departure will be a great relief to me. And the very same observation might have been repeated by every soldier in blue down in Chattanooga 
For some 10,000 infantrymen and 5,000 mounted men filed out of the Confederate lines. Bragg's force was reduced to just over 40,000 men, and they had to defend an eight-mile-long position. Down below, a far more concentrated Union force now numbered, with Major General William T. Sherman's arrival, 56 to 60,000 men. This numerical advantage played into the hands of offensive-minded U.S. Grant, who, quite frankly, was sick and tired of being cooped up in Chattanooga. But to strike, federal boys would have to leave well-prepared defensive positions and attack an elevated and entrenched enemy. Still inclined to make the move, Grant wanted three different units to take the offensive. To his friend and trusted lieutenant, Grant elected to give Sherman and his Army of the Tennessee the most pivotal role. Quite honestly, Grant was suspicious of Major General Joe Hooker's 11th and 12th Corps, two corps technically assigned to the Army of the Cumberland. The commanding general reasoned the 11th and 12th were castoffs from the Army of the Potomac, and there was some truth to that. As for Thomas and his Army of the Cumberland, Grant was suspicious. This was the same army that had been badly whipped at Chickamauga, and Grant worried about its fighting spirit. And to add to his concern, the commanding general had concern about the Army of the Cumberland's commanding officer, George H. Thomas. Here was Grant's plan. His target would be the Confederate right, which was at the juncture of Bragg's supply line from the south and his line of communication with Longstreet to the north. To get at it, Sherman would have to march upriver from Bridgeport to Browns Ferry, cross to the north side of the Tennessee River, and move into the hills north of Chattanooga. To confuse the Confederates as to Sherman's intention, Grant wanted one of Sherman's divisions to make a feint against Bragg's left on Lookout Mountain. Meanwhile, the bulk of Sherman's men would march northward to give the impression they were headed to Knoxville. Once out of Confederate sight, those men would lie hidden, wait, then in a nighttime move would cross the river via pontoons, hit Bragg's right, roll it up along Missionary Ridge, cut off the Confederate supply line, and drive, if not destroy, the Confederate Army of Tennessee. Hooker's two corps and Thomas's army were to assume support roles. Grant wanted Joe Hooker to strike the Confederate left, move around Lookout Mountain, and threaten Rossville Gap, which was another Confederate supply line and possible retreat route. Thomas was to give Sherman artillery support and later make a diversionary assault on the Confederate center on Missionary Ridge. That, he hoped, would keep Bragg from sending reinforcements to either his left or right. The coordinated attack was scheduled for Saturday. November 21st. Sherman hurried to Bridgeport and prepared for his 27-mile march. Mother Nature then played her card. Heavy rain delayed Sherman's march. Grant pressed him, but the rain did not let up. It fell on the 20th and 21st and turned roads into soup, and the rising Tennessee River threatened the pontoon bridge at Brown's Ferry. Despite the deluge, Sherman drove his men, and just before the last of Sherman's divisions crossed, the river carried the pontoon bridge away. Undaunted, Sherman moved toward his jumping-off point. The effort was Herculean, but battling the elements, too much time had been lost. It was now Sunday, November the 22nd. Grant had to push his timetable back and now ordered Sherman to make his attack on Tuesday the 24th. The commanding general hoped Sherman's marching and shifting confused his counterpart. Oh, did it ever. Bragg wasn't sure if Grant was preparing to flank his left on Lookout Mountain, was heading north to reinforce Knoxville, or merely reinforcing Thomas within Chattanooga. Bragg finally believed that Sherman was headed for Knoxville, and so ordered two of his divisions to head north to reinforce Longstreet. One division, under Simon Bolivar Buckner, left immediately. 
The other, under Major General Patrick Claiborne, waited at the railroad yards for the trains carrying Buckner's men to return. It was about this time a Confederate communication puzzled Grant. Bragg sent him a message that read, As there may still be some non-combatants in Chattanooga, I deem it proper to notify you that prudence would dictate their early withdrawal. Was Bragg about to attack? And why? For back on Sunday the 22nd, a Confederate deserter entered the Federal lines and, when interrogated, reported that Bragg was pulling back from Missionary Ridge. That was false, but Grant didn't know that. He had to make sure what was what. He needed someone to tap Confederate reflexes. Sherman was on the march and couldn't do it, but Thomas could. So early on the morning of Monday, November the 23rd, Thomas received orders. In the plain between Chattanooga and Missionary Ridge, there was a wooded mound called Orchard Knob. For weeks, Bragg's force held the valley and the wooded mound. Thomas was to hit it, a reconnaissance in force, to see if the positions there in the Chattanooga Valley still bristled with a strong Confederate military presence. For the Army of the Cumberland, here was an opportunity. You see, Thomas was very aware that this movement would be seen by friend and foe alike. The attack would be made in a natural amphitheater created by the surrounding hills. It was indeed rare for an attack to be so clearly seen. At noon on Monday the 23rd, the men of Brigadier General Thomas J. Wood, the same men who had created the near-fatal gap back at Chickamauga two months earlier, those men were in the center. On their right, Major General Philip Sheridan's division, which back in September broke and ran before James Longstreet's sledgehammer. Wood and Sheridan's men still boiled from their defeat, and even more so from Grant's thinly concealed suspicion of their mettle. These men of the Army of the Cumberland were eager to correct his opinion. With two more divisions on left and right to offer support, all marched out of the Chattanooga defenses as if on parade, and then stopped. The scene was jaw-dropping. Flags flying, drums beating, officers barking, order, sun glinting off some 10,000 polished bayonets. Confederate and Union soldiers alike stopped to watch. Then a signal cannon, and the blue wave ebbed forward. Confederates out in the valley quickly realized this was no review, this was no parade. They were under attack, and so scurried back for cover. In stunningly short order, George Thomas's men not only drove in Bragg's pickets, but seized the ground they had covered. Orchard Knob was theirs, and the Union line was now fully a mile in front of the one from which they advanced. True, it was a minor action, but Grant now knew that Bragg was indeed on the scene, and the native North Carolinian was now quite aware that Bragg was done with sitting on his hands. Bragg hastily called back Claiborne's division, one of the two sent to Knoxville. Then he pulled a division off Lookout Mountain and placed it on Missionary Ridge. Bragg reacted, but now it was Grant's game to play, and he was about to reveal his hand. Sherman's men were hidden, and they were ready. 116 pontoon boats were prepared for ferrying Sherman's men across the Tennessee River. After each ferrying trip across, that pontoon would be lashed with the one before to make a pontoon bridge. It stretched 1,350 feet long. Bridge complete, the rest of Sherman's men poured across with little opposition. There was a reason for that. With his men across the river, Sherman, peering through the mist and rain, had a shock. His objective had been the northernmost part of Missionary Ridge, known locally as Tunnel Hill. There was little resistance because he and his men were on the wrong hill. They were indeed on a hill, 
but a deep valley separated the hill they were on and Confederate held Tunnel Hill. Maps showed Grant and Sherman that Missionary Ridge ran continuously, but in reality it did not. Sherman and his men were at the wrong place, and worse, their element of surprise was gone. He ordered his men to dig in and prepare themselves for what the Confederates might throw back at them the next day. In Grant's original plan, Sherman was supposed to attack the Confederate right on the 24th, but the only fighting that day was done by Joe Hooker's men on the Confederate left. This is what happened with them. Dawn of Tuesday, November 24th, was wet gray. Hooker had three divisions, one from each Federal army on the field, some 10,000 men who had been given 60 rounds and one day's ration. If he could take Lookout Mountain, that would be great. But Hooker wanted more. He wanted to drive down into the valley below and clear Confederate troops positioned between Lookout and Missionary Ridge. From there, he could push on and take possession of Rossville Gap, which would allow him to threaten the Confederate left and rear. The movement began at 8 o'clock in the morning. The two-pronged advance began with men feeling blindly through the dense fog that shrouded the mountain. The terrain made the march just to get into position, laborious, and then there was the matter of befriended pickets after days of fraternization. As they advanced, several shouted, Oh, Johnny Reb! Johnny Reb! When a Confederate soldier moved forward most amicably, one Union soldier yelled, Go back, Johnny! Go back! We are ordered to fire on you! He dove for cover, and the Union line indeed opened fire. Most of the 7,000 scattered Confederates who were on Lookout Mountain and above the Union advanced looked down and were amused at first by all the artillery commotion below. Then came the disturbing rolling report of rifled musket fire, which meant men on foot were not far away. Confederate defenders there belonged to Major Generals John C. Breckinridge and Carter L. Stevenson. They had been moved to that area only recently and, as a result, were not familiar with the terrain. Neither were the Federals, but despite the unfamiliarity, the fog and rain, the two-pronged Federal advance units united, and Bragg's left was in serious jeopardy. I'd like to take a moment to thank everyone for listening to Threads from the National Tapestry. You know, each of these episodes is the result of hours and hours of research and preparation, and it means a great deal to me and our production team to see the likes, the comments, and views. I mean, let me make clear that everything we do here will always, always be accessible to any who are curious to learn about the American Civil War. But we would like to ask you to consider to become a member, uh, a Threads loyalist, if you will. For less than $5 each month, your support will help us to continue sharing our passion for that tumultuous yet important period of history. Joining is quite easy to do. At the top of each show, description. You'll find uh, lo a link, if you will, to join whether you're watching, liking, commenting, or becoming a Threads loyalist. If you click on that link, your support for Threads from the National Tapestry will mean a great deal to me, to our team, and there's no question, any contribution, your support certainly makes a difference, and it's a wonderful acknowledgement for what we try to do. Thank you. Back down in Chattanooga, low-hanging clouds affected the vision of not only those above, but those below Lookout Mountain. From the town below, the battle and mountain loomed, as one correspondent put it, like an everlasting thunderstorm. Around dusk, the clouds blew away, but darkness threw its cape around those Union soldiers on the heights. That night, the air was cold and 
cloudless, the heavens were in full splendor. Those who gazed heavenward were treated to an astronomical wonder, an eclipse of the moon. Both armies thought it an omen, and interestingly enough, both read the eclipse as bad tidings for Braxton Bragg and his confederates. The next day, Wednesday the 25th, Hooker's men found that Lookout Mountain had been abandoned by the enemy. Union soldiers edged forward, and at first light, Captain John Wilson and five men from the 8th Kentucky climbed to the summit of Lookout Mountain and staged a sight that few ever forgot. Just before sunrise, carrying a furled U.S. flag, they stepped out onto an overhanging rock high above the city, and when the ascending sun's rays hit the peak, they unfurled the stars and stripes. Down in Chattanooga, the moment was electric. Wild cheers erupted, bands played, and an English observer put it, the pealing of the bands was as if all the harps in heaven were filling the dome with triumphant music. The euphoria pushed many to poetically call the contest for Lookout Mountain the battle above the clouds. It was indeed a great accomplishment, but in reality, in actuality, not a major battle, and the casualty reports reinforced that assessment. The battle for Lookout Mountain cost 1,251 Confederate casualties, 1,054 of whom were captured, and only 480 Union casualties. There were many, including the star for victory Joseph Hooker, who thought the victory represented the symbolic end of the siege. But there was one who would have none of that bluster. Grant belittled the victory. As to the self-proclaimed battle above the clouds, Grant wrote, It is all poetry. However, to the common soldier, it was far more than poetry. It meant trains carrying rations, supplies, and ammunition could now run unimpeded from Bridgeport, Alabama to Chattanooga. Steamers could enter the city. No more dependence on the cracker line. And with plenty of ammo and full bellies, morale soared, and Grant used it to continue chipping away at Bragg. The next blow was aimed at Bragg's right the very next day. To assist that planned assault, a diversion, as we mentioned earlier, was planned and was to be directed at the Confederate Center on Missionary Ridge. Its stepping off point was Orchard Knob, the wooded mound captured by Thomas's army back on the 23rd. To set the table for the grand plan that was to take place on the 25th, at first light the day before, Sherman pushed six divisions and 26,000 men toward Tunnel Hill. In front of them, some 10,000 Confederates under Major Generals Stevenson and Claiborne. The grand military scheme? Sherman was to strike the Confederate right, Hooker the left, and again, Thomas as a diversion was to hit the Confederate center and capitalize on any Federal advantage on either flank. Wednesday, November the 25th, broke clear and bright. Though outnumbered on the Confederate right, Claiborne and Stevenson had the advantage of terrain. Sherman's one-half-mile attack would have to be made by sending men down a hill, then through a little valley. Next was an open area which would allow Confederates a clear field of fire, then a steep ascent where Confederates were dug in behind log and earth breastworks. Those men in butternut and gray held a strong, compact line that had been laid out by Claiborne himself. Sherman was slow to start that morning, but by 10 a.m. his blue waves pressed forward. He found Claiborne's defense stout, so stout that after two hours of attacks and counterattacks, Claiborne's Confederate line not only held, but inflicted some 2,000 Federal casualties. Sherman communicated to Grant that he could do no more. Grant's reply was quick, and it was to the point. Attack again. 
Sherman followed his orders, but with the reality facing him in the form of Claiborne's men, he attacked half-heartedly. He sent in only 200 men who were, as he expected, cut to pieces. A correspondent standing near Sherman watched him light a fresh cigar, draw deeply on it, and then turn to an aide, tell the men to entrench and go back into position. There would be no more Union attacks on the Confederate right that day. No more repulses before Tunnel Hill. Sherman's lack of success now increased the urgency of Hooker's push on the Union right. Around 3 p.m., the 12th Corps under Hooker reached Rossville Gap and attacked. That assault made some headway, but complete success was delayed, then denied by collapsed bridges. Wednesday, the 25th, was slipping away. Those gathered on Orchard Knob knew it. From there, Grant, Thomas, and one of his corps commanders, Major General Gordon Granger, could plainly see Bragg's headquarters and the three-mile-long Confederate center atop Missionary Ridge. Darkness was coming on. There had been setback, particularly on the Union left, and Grant, with little confidence in the Army of the Cumberland, had given no orders to Thomas all day. All day, Thomas and his Army of the Cumberland watched, waited, and seethed. Finally, after Grant feared Bragg was reinforcing his right to strike Sherman, Grant, to relieve pressure on his left, gave Thomas and his men a limited objective. They were to move forward and take only the rifle pits at the foot of Missionary Ridge, then stop and await further instructions. Two divisions of Granger's 4th Corps and two from the 14th Corps would make the attack. Granger would oversee it. Ordered to attack, Thomas and Grant awaited Granger's execution. An hour passed, and there was no attack. Grant, much to his chagrin, learned Granger, for whatever reason, never passed along the order to attack. Granger, as was his nervous habit, had been personally directing the fire of Union artillery. Abruptly, Thomas turned to him and snapped, Pay more attention to your corps, sir. Grant now pounced. If you will leave that battery to its captain and take command of your corps, it will be better for all of us. The order for attack was given, and divisions under Brigadier Generals Absalom Baird, Thomas J. Wood, and Richard W. Johnson, and Major General Philip Sheridan made ready. Interestingly, all servants, cooks, and even clerks were armed. Stung by Grant's slights, the much maligned Army of the Cumberland was eager to erase the painful memory of Chickamauga. As one Hoosier put it, we were crazy to charge. There were 23,000 strong, and with lines, ruler, straight, the assemblage was quite an intimidating sight to those Confederates in front of and above on Missionary Ridge. At about 3.30 or 3.40 p.m., there were six rapid cannon shots, and all four divisions ebbed forward like molten lava. Immediately, artillery on both sides opened. Bragg's headquarters, an easy target, was riddled. Much of the Confederate cannon fire overshot. Its shells passed over the heads of the surging Union mass. First, they advanced through cottonwood timber. The wooded, bare trees without leaves meant that Confederate defenders could see the advance. When the men in blue emerged from the timber, the main body broke into a spontaneous run, from quick step to double quick step. They moved so fast, they actually caught up with their skirmishers. Ahead, Bragg had divided regiments with half in the first rifle pits, which were 200 yards out in front of the base of Missionary Ridge. They were instructed that if attacked, fire one volley, then fall back. However, not all the men in the first and second lines got the word. That miscommunication would prove disastrous. 
With the Federals now only 200 yards away, the first Confederate line erupted in fire and then followed orders. They fell back. This encouraged the Federals to come on, and those Confederates who didn't get the order to fall back were swept over and captured. With the first line of Confederate rifle pits taken rather easily, Colonel John Martin of the 8th Kansas said what everybody else was thinking. We can't stay here. We can't live here. If they stopped as ordered at the first rifle pits, they were targets for every Confederate who were further up the slope. A sudden restlessness swelled within all. Then suddenly, spontaneously, almost every unit lunged forward and upward independently of one another. Wood's division led the attack. Sheridan held his men, uncertain whether to bend Grant's order, but they, too, surrendered to the fiery urge. They pushed onward. It was contagious. Baird and Johnson's division joined the surge. All along the lines, one could hear repeatedly, Forward! Forward! Jagged knots, like blue triangular tongues, in arrow-like sorties, all stormed up the ridge. All semblance of order was gone. The Army of the Cumberland literally fled forward. The climb was so steep that many men were on hands and knees, dragging their forty rounds of ammunition, nine-pound muskets, and overcoats. Some thrust bayonets in the ground to gain traction. Others grabbed branches and limbs, puffing, perspiring, crawling, all done without cheering, they pressed upwards. Back down on Orchard Knob, Grant was stunned. He wheeled angrily on Thomas, who was standing beside him. Thomas, who ordered those men up the ridge? Impassively, Thomas answered, I don't know. I did not. Grant now turned on Granger and barked, Did you order them up, Granger? He answered, no. They started without orders. Then with great satisfaction, Granger added, and when those fellows get started, all hell can't stop them. Grant then said, well, somebody will suffer if they don't stay there. Major General U.S. Grant was experiencing a general's nightmare, a battle gone out of control. Granger did send couriers to ask what was going on. One of them found Wood, who shouted that he gave no such order, but would like to know who in hell was going to stop them. When Wood's response was reported back to the three Union officers on Orchard Knob, Granger said aloud that he approved the impromptu dash, but Grant snarled, if Wood fails, by God, he'll pay for it. Peering below, members of Bragg's staff thought the Federals drunk. It was about this time something transpired that Bragg and his standing orders had not figured. When Confederates fell back as mandated, they disrupted the field of their comrades' fire positioned above. Their falling back also gave the Federals the impression that there was Southern panic and that fueled pursuit. Another Union advantage, smoke from black powder rifled muskets engulfed Confederate defenders such that they could not make out or clearly distinguish their attackers. And in addition, another blunder, one that spelled disaster. Incompetent engineers laid out the Confederate breastworks along the geographic crest of Missionary Ridge rather than the military one. Rifle and artillery fire could not be sufficiently depressed to fire on the Union troops who were literally climbing their way to the top. Things were so desperate, some Confederate batteries lit fuses in shells and then rolled them down by hand. Along with lit shells, Confederates rolled boulders through rocks. It was an unexpected and glorious Union success, but how great depended on the amount of daylight left. A little after five, the sun dipped behind the horizon and the temperatures plunged. But on through the purple and gray light of day and smoke, the Federals continued to surge. As each group of seemingly possessed Federals neared the next line of breastworks, they came eye to eye with Confederate defenders. Over and over, the same moment, one in blue bracing himself and then surging over. 
One Mississippian watched a blue wave roll in from the 6th Indiana and 5th Kentucky and addressed one of their officers. Hiya, Captain. I want to surrender. What shall I do? He responded, get over them logs to this side. You'll be in the United States then. One U.S. private jumped into a rifle pit and found five Confederates with aimed rifles pointed directly at him. The private shouted, Surrender, you goddamn fools, or I'll shoot every one of you. Incredibly, they did. Some Federals began to shout what Confederates had tauntingly used earlier in the attack. Chickamauga. Chickamauga. One Confederate captain was captured by a private and refused to go down the hill. The Federal growled, Chickamauga, God damn you, and kicked him in the seat of the pants, causing him to tumble down the slope. Caught up in the moment, Major General Philip Sheridan. He grabbed a hip flask, raised it, and toasted the Confederates. Here's to you, Bragg. At that very instant, a Confederate shell burst right in front and showered him with dirt. He growled, That is ungenerous. I shall take those guns for that. At almost every point of the attack, there were momentary lulls when Union attackers stared right into the faces of Confederate defenders, when success or failure could go either way. One example might represent all at that moment. In the attack center... Lieutenant Colonel Barrett Langdon led the intermingled 23rd Kentucky and 41st Ohio. They reached that instant when so much teetered one way or the other. After a few moments, but what seemed an eternity, Langdon stood to press the last few yards, and a Confederate rifleman shot him through the face. He fell heavily on his stomach and did not move. His men froze. Then slowly, incredibly, Langdon rose to his knees and with a, I am not killed yet, went up, over, and into the Confederate position. Incredible acts like that occurred everywhere on the slope of Missionary Ridge, wounded refusing to stop, and no surprise, Union heroes were everywhere. One was a lieutenant by the name of Arthur MacArthur, Jr., who was the fourth color bearer that afternoon for the 24th Wisconsin. It was he that led them up the steep climb, shouting, On Wisconsin! The story goes that at the top, Sheridan led the 18-year-old back to his division and remarked, Take care of him. He has just won the Medal of Honor. It took 27 years But the father of Douglas MacArthur got his Medal of Honor. Such acts of bravery from men in butternut and gray were few, and in part that was because of Braxton Bragg's destructive, demeaning leadership. It seemed he was demoralizing when there was no fighting and indecisive when there was. Dumbfounded and paralyzed in this brazen Union attack, He had no reserve to throw in. When the damage was far too great to be reversed, he left his headquarters and he rode into the Confederate chaos, clutching a large flag. There he shouted, Here's your commander! He was jeered. One of his lieutenants, John C. Breckinridge, whose men had been driven back on the Confederate left some two and a half miles, saw it all for what it was and advised... Boys, get away the best you can. He and Bragg narrowly escaped capture. Only Claiborne on the Confederate right held. Now, in defense of the Confederate defenders on Missionary Ridge, the ridge itself was so narrow that it was extremely difficult to fall back and regroup. Falling back to the top and being pressed meant that they had to descend the reverse slope. When the Federals reached the crest previously occupied by their Confederate tormentors, cheers rose to the heavens up and down the line. In delirious celebration, haversacks were thrown into the air, so many that from below it looked like a cloud of black spots. Down at Orchard Knob, Granger couldn't contain himself anymore. 
He left Grant and Thomas, and he rode into the midst of the Union celebration, playing upon their liberal interpretation of Grant's original orders. He shouted gleefully, I'm going to have you all court-martialed. You were ordered to take the works at the foot of the hill, and you have taken those at the top. You have disobeyed orders. That day, that unscheduled dash up Missionary Ridge had been like a beach codenamed Omaha some 81 years in the future, had been a common soldier's victory. Federal Brigadier General John Beatty wrote, I detected in the management what I had never discovered before on the battlefield, a little common sense. On the other side, trying to keep the Confederate route from cascading into an unmitigated disaster, there was the native Irishman Brigadier General Patrick Claiborne. He had held Sherman all day, and in doing so, was not aware of the absolute chaos back to his left. Another Confederate officer, Lieutenant General William Hardy, rode up and informed Claiborne of the disaster. Though his men were exhausted, they now had to cover a Confederate retreat. They had to because Philip Sheridan drove his men in pursuit and did so all the way to Chickamauga Station. They stayed at pursuit until 2 a.m. Earlier, there had been a moment when Sheridan allowed himself to celebrate. Reaching the crest of Missionary Ridge, he jumped astride a cannon that had fired at him earlier. Another soldier followed his lead and burned his backside so badly that he could not sit down for two weeks. In the stunning victory, Sheridan's divisional casualties were 1,304, half of all the Federal losses in the attack. His work that day turned heads. Of all the Union field generals at Chattanooga, his status soared the highest. Most of the Confederate casualties at Chattanooga came as a result of being forced to surrender. In three days of combat, there were 6,700 Confederate casualties, 4,100 of them captured. No question, November the 25th, 1863, was the saddest day in the largely depressing history of leadership for the Confederate Army of Tennessee. The common soldiers in that army deserved far better. In the Union victory at Chattanooga, Grant suffered a total of 5,800 casualties. In relative comparison to many Civil War battles, Chattanooga was won without great bloodshed. That evening of the 25th, the Federal Military Department of the Mississippi sent a modestly worded message of victory to Washington City. However, though there had been a great success, in hindsight, Grant failed to fully capitalize. He and Thomas returned to Chattanooga proper around 7 p.m. Yes, the two had won a great and unexpected victory, but let what to do with it slip away. Then again, one portion of Grant's force knew what the victory meant. The tortured soul of the Army of the Cumberland had been vindicated. The stain of Chickamauga washed clean. Ironically, the next day, a Thursday, November 26th, was a day Mr. Lincoln had set aside back on October the 3rd. He proclaimed it a day of thanksgiving. Back in Washington City, he was still in bed, still down with a mild form of smallpox that set in just after his address in Gettysburg a week earlier. Chattanooga was a great Union win, but there was a sad note. The events on the slopes of Missionary Ridge validated the military record of George Henry Thomas, old slow trot, the rock of Chickamauga but Grant slighted him in the official record. Grant wrote, incorrectly, I might add, that Sherman took part of the same range of hills and that Sherman's force tied up a large portion of the enemy which allowed Thomas and the Army of the Cumberland's success on Missionary Ridge. Grant left Chattanooga thinking Thomas was slow and argumentative. 
down the road that would lead to some very awkward moments. For the Confederate Army of Tennessee, their commander's days were finally, finally numbered. Just as he did after the battles of Stones River and Chickamauga, Braxton Bragg submitted his resignation. This time, on Monday, November the 30th, it was accepted. Temporary command of the Hard Luck Army went to Lieutenant General William Hardy. Shortly thereafter, command was given to General Joseph E. Johnston. Bragg was ordered to Richmond, where his talents suited him, not in the field, but as a military advisor to Jefferson Davis. If one visits Chattanooga, he or she is struck by the elevations of Missionary Ridge, Lookout Mountain. Back in October and November of 1863, those elevated features gave rise to a man whose victory at Chattanooga springboarded him to new heights. In only a few months, the man from Galena, Illinois, Major General U.S. Grant, would be offered the nation's highest military command. In March of 1864, he would be promoted to the full rank of Lieutenant General the first full lieutenant general since George Washington. And with that lofty promotion was named general-in-chief of all Union armies. His leadership at Chattanooga ensured that, after three and a half years of war, Mr. Lincoln had finally found his general. And that man was going to pour men through a door smashed open to Georgia, an open door that bared the very heart of the Confederacy. When we next gather, we'll return to another pivotal point in the war in the West. In an effort to press Union advantage, or stall it, two armies vied for control of a little town just southeast of Nashville, Tennessee. A little town that either allowed for Union advance into central Tennessee or revived Southern hope in reversing federal designs on Murfreesboro and to the southeast Chattanooga. I hope you'll join us for the powerful stories of those who clashed in the final days of 1862 and the first few days of 1863. Next time, the story of the Battle of Murfreesboro, the story of Stones River. This is Fred Kiger. Thank you for listening.